Um, well, thank you all for having me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and discuss my ongoing research project about the Tunguska explosion of 1908 and the many efforts to try to understand it um, in the Soviet Union and beyond. Um, I want to start today with just sort of a vignette from my research um, that happened during, in 1960. This is more than a half century after the initial blast over Siberia, um, in, which happened in 1908. Um, it was a large enough blast that it would have probably obliterated all of Helsinki, just to give you the scale of it. Um, and uh, it was then, and still remains, not 100% clear what happened, what caused it. There's some very likely scenarios, but, but, but conclusive uh, evidence um, has not fully been reached. Anyway, um, in 1960, two of the participants, um, one of them, uh, Boris Voronsky, fishing there, and the other, uh, Andrei Zolotov, um, uh, participated, okay? These two men had, both had their own sort of views of Tunguska that were somewhat outside the mainstream. Voronsky, um, at the time, believed that it was possibly a stony meteorite, not an iron meteorite, or a, a, a piece of a comet, which was the more popular view. And Zolotov um, thought that the theory of a science fiction writer he had read, Alexander Kazantsev, that this was caused by an atomic explosion from a vessel of aliens, um, really was probably right. Okay? Uh, and the, otherwise, these are two, so these are two very different people. Right, Zolotov is a sort of geophysicist, but very much coming from the margins in terms of his thinking. Ronsky was a former Gulag boss. He actually worked as a geologist in Kalima um, before this, and then spends his retirement years uh, first uh, collaborating with uh, the uh, Academy of Sciences expeditions, and then joining these amateur expeditions. Both of them um, during this 1960 expedition, though, commented about how the trees in the taiga of the blast site spoke to them, gave them evidence. Vronsky particularly talks about having to, about cutting down a tree and feeling bad about it. But what would he do? Um, it was a pity to destroy this long-suffering tree, but it was a living and impartial witness to the distant and mysterious event. And so we had to cut it down. Zolotov is even more lyrical, writing that the trees of the forest will not be silent. They are the main witnesses of the catastrophe, and therefore it is precisely it, the forest, whether preserved, perished, or regrown, that will help solve the mystery. This moment speaks to me because it gets at something where the Tunguska site itself is speaking to these two individuals involved in researching it, as a force that helps them understand and unravel the mystery. They, the natural world is part of what they're, they're interested in. This is not a, talking about trees as part of commerce or trees as simply an object of study from the perspective of forestry, or even talking about this sort of spiritual communion that one might get from a stroll in the forest. This is about trees speaking as an accomplice solving a mystery, okay? And I think that this is one of the interesting environmental legacies, environmental uh, elements um, that the story of the Tunguska explosion can offer for the environmental humanities and can offer for uh, the study of the Soviet Union. Um, and that's what I'm gonna focus on today. So first I wanna give you a little bit more background about the Tunguska event uh, and the efforts to study it a little bit about the overall project that I'm undertaking right now, uh, and then get into this sort of one of my main ideas for the project, this idea that mystery solving becomes a sort of organizing principle for environmental relations um, at this patch of the Siberian taiga. So June 30th, 1908, June 17th uh, in the Russian calendar at the time, about 7.15 in the morning, this massive explosion occurs over the Siberian taiga um, in a place that's 
relatively remote even for Siberia. It's a bit north of Bratsk, uh, near the trading post of Vanavale, today in the Krasnoyarsk uh, Krai. Um, it uh, is heard and seen from very from miles away. There ends up being plenty of witnesses. Um, and it chars and, and levels thousands of trees over, uh, over 200 square kilometers <clears throat> of the boggy Siberian taiga. Um, people heard the blast, they heard the, the, the they, they felt the thunders, things, they saw a fireball in the sky. It gets written up in the newspaper at the time, and then it sort of goes away. There's a lot of reasons for this in terms of just you know, how connected the world was, how distant it was. Um, we later learned that there are few people that clearly were injured from this blast, but ultimately not that many um, people uh, were hurt, or and a few might have died, but, but even that's unclear, and it's often said that no one died, though I think the evidence now shows that at least a few people did. It wasn't until the 1920s when a meteorite a mineralogist turned meteorite specialist named Leonid Kulik began to sort of hear about this supposed Siberian blast that um, efforts to research it really begin. So he learns about it in 1921, um, starts making efforts to get to the site, um, and only achieves that in 1927, um, partially because of lack of funding, partially because his first go at getting anywhere close doesn't they don't get anywhere close. When he gets there, um, this is what he sees. Tons, hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, an area hundreds of kilometers wide with leveled trees uh, and a few, in what they, he suspects to be the emphasis center, a few standing ones in the center. Um, this he feels is a very eerie sight. It speaks to how dramatic and uh, extensive the force of the blast was, okay? Um, Kulik then begins a series of expeditions in the late 1920s to try to figure out, uh, to try to essentially find the meteorite. It's like, this is a, he's a meteorite specialist. Like, this is clearly one of the, this huge meteorite explosion. Let's go find it. Uh, I'll talk more about these expeditions in a few minutes, but essentially they come up that pretty handed. They find neither an obvious crater nor evidence of a meteorite at the site in the 1920s or in 1930s. After the Second World War, another idea kind of comes into play in the history of Tunguska. Uh, and this begins with a science fiction writer, or, or an engineer turned science fiction writer, mm -hmm. Alexander Kazantsev, who publishes a story, uh, Explosion, uh, of short stories, a fic work of fiction, in uh, uh, the literary magazine Vakuk Svieta, um, and then reworks it, another story in uh, Znanie Sila. Um, and this proposes that he's writing right after Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed by the US. Uh, and he hears the details of some of this. And he proposes that maybe it was a nuclear explosion. Maybe that could have caused such a blast to happen and there wouldn't be a meteorite there. But how could there have been a nuclear explosion in 1908? Nuclear bombs hadn't been invented yet. They were just sort of, you know, made their destructive appearance in the world with uh, US bombing. Um, and he's like, well, maybe it's possible that there was a uranium meteorite. Talks to some physicists, learns that this really wouldn't be possible, and then comes upon this idea that maybe an alien spaceship powered by nuclear power exploded, got into an accident over the Siberian taiga in 1908 and exploded. Now, at first, Kazantsev thinks this is a short story, but soon he's putting on this show at the Moscow Planetarium that's treating this idea not just as science fiction, but as a real hypothesis. And hundreds of people go to see it. It becomes a sort of scandal where you have some of the meteorite scientists try, like, waste, or devoting their time to saying that Kazantsev's wrong, it's not a meteorite. Um, and you know this sort of flare-up goes away for a few years after the early 1950s, but it comes back in the Thaw era with 
renewed expeditions to the site. First off, the Academy of Sciences puts out a new, starts a new expedition under um, Kirill Florensky, son of the Orthodox uh, theologian Pavel Florensky, um, that goes to the site, and they, one of the things they immediately realize is, you know what, we've been saying there must be a meteorite there. Maybe this explosion was above ground just something that Kazantsev had first sort of said was a possibility. That inspires um, the amateur, all of these amateur expeditionaries to go and make treks out to the Siberian taiga. This includes the person earlier, Zolotov, but also this whole group called, uh, from Tomsk and Novosibirsk that call themselves the Complex Amateur Expedition. And they start making annual treks out to uh, the Siberian taiga to search for evidence of either a comet or a meteorite or a spaceship. Okay, They're, a lot of them are divided about this. And at one point in 1961, uh, they even have a combined expedition with the, the Academy of Sciences, where you have these amateur expeditionaries, um, some of whom got into this because they thought there must have been aliens involved working with scientists from the Academy of Sciences, and these are some of them during this um, expedition. What essentially happens is the main ideas about Tunguska at this point becomes the idea that it was actually probably not a meteorite, but a fragment of a comet. This sort of lasts as the main idea with these amateur expeditionaries getting more and more evidence that might shed light on that until the 80s and 90s where um, for a variety of reasons, the science of comets and asteroids have changed enough that they say, you know what it most likely is, it was a, a fragment of an asteroid that exploded in air, an airburst explosion. Uh, in 2013, there was a very clear um, case where something like this happened in Chelyabinsk, or in Russia, where there was an airburst explosion of a meteorite that for a lot of people essentially solved from Tunguska, but not for everyone, because other theories emerged. Whether it was aliens or whether it was Nikola Tesla experimenting with his death ray, trying to send a signal to the North Pole. This becomes a sort of popular sort of um, idea about Tunguska that, that, that um, has garnered a lot of attention in paranormal and New Age circles and things like that. Um, so that's essentially where the basic outlines of the story um, that I think actually, so I've told it in a sort of very straightforward way, but I think is an interesting story for us to think about the history of science and environmental history. And what I've been working on is digging really deeply into this story in order to think about the history of disasters, the history of alternative knowledge, the history of uh, interactions with landscapes in ways that I think um, are new and interesting. Um, so I've had some support from uh, NASA and the History of Science Society. I've been able to visit about 10 archives in Russia, uh, including, and then some in the US, uh, a lot of work in libraries, um, very valuable uh, website that has um, uh, collected a mass amount of primary source material um, has made it easy to do some of this research in my pajamas at home. Um, uh, but I also got to the site only by helicopter uh, as well and had the uh, chance to interview um, more than 20 of the amateur researchers who have investigated Tunguska since the 1950s, including two who passed away this year but were in their 80s and 90s, but I was able to get a chance to, to see them. Uh, book's now under contract, so I'm suppo supposed to be done with it next year, and it was supposed to be out in a few years, so now I have pressure. Okay, um, more substantively, what I'm looking at, what the main sort of argument that I'm going to be making in the book is that Tungusha produced um, a distinctive set of conceptual and material interactions with the natural world, but this is a sort of, it's the, the, the blast itself is mere, the distinctiveness of the blast itself is mirrored by its distinctiveness in global environmental history as a, an event that, where the connections between place and knowledge uh, manifest themselves in very distinctive ways. Um, 
and that is and, and in, in a sort of dialectical way. Both the Siberian and cosmic locations of the explosion contributed interesting things to scientific and fast, fantastic thinking, um, while the investigations of Tunguska itself brought about distinctive environmental behaviors. Um, and to sort of flesh this out, I then have three sort of main points. One is that um, this remote Siberian location becomes a sort of laboratory for thinking about disasters and for thinking about outer space. That um, some of the perspectives that we have about environmental catastrophes and environmental disasters today um, were being sort of contemplated and, and, and thought through um, in terms of the vast, you know, expanse of the universe and how humanity's place on this, on this tiny, tiny speck of it um, is perilous either for, for many different reasons. Um, it also was a place that facilitated this sort of productive relationship between fantasy and scientific knowledge. Um, you know, there's some of the people who are very interested in the wild theories about Tunguska um, were not very serious as empirical researchers, but a lot of them were. A lot of them were like, let's go do all the research first, set aside our hypotheses, um, and uh, you know, take part in this sort of interface that existed, that, be, that emerged in the Soviet Union where um, people sort of from the mar with marginal views could um, uh, you know, be part of a scientific conversation. Um, and then finally, and this is what I'm going to focus on uh, with most of the rest of my time, is that the blast gave rise to a sort of unique set of environmental practices that were intentionally designed to solve the mystery, to solve a mystery. Um, I'll explain this more in a second, but, but that this is sort of a distinctive part of, of, um, of the connection between knowledge and place that the Tunguska event reveals. Now, um, this sort of idea of mystery solving uh, really came home to me uh, at one point during my research. Um, I was in Tulum spending most of my time in the archives, um, but got to go out um, to the outskirts of South town with a veteran of Tunguska research Stanislav uh, Krivyakov, who invited me to, instead of coming and having coffee with him or something like that, let's go out to the woods. Let's go hike around. I immediately, and there's a way in which, and we hiked around not just anywhere, but to the places where the amateur Tunguski researchers would train for their expeditions um, before going there in the summer. Um, and I immediately sort of, you know, felt some of the things that a lot of the Tunguska researchers have talked about with finding sort of, a, you know, their own little corner of freedom, for instance, uh, in uh, the Tunguska site during these ex expeditions um, of, uh, you know, my, part of it was just that it was after a long winter and being in something green was nice. But uh, I do feel that I, I, I kind of understood that. I also talked to Kuryakov about this whole idea about, well, what did it mean what environmental ideas did you guys have? And he immediately picked up on this idea that there was a unique way, a distinctive way, that um, the balance between um, intruding into the environment and preserving the environment was very much shaped by their objective to figure out Tunguska. And to me, that suggests that we, we have something different going on here. This isn't agriculture. It's a common environmental use of nature. This isn't urban building cities. This isn't protecting uh, a landscape, uh, putting aside a landscape purely for preservation. This isn't uh, militarizing a landscape. This isn't um, uh, you know, industrializing a place, turning it into a major factory or, 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 or works. Um, it isn't even sort of setting aside an experimental plot to see what might happen given certain environmental conditions. The relationship with the site is, has been oriented in the 20th century around solving a mystery. And I think that that's an interesting sort of um, way 
and a, a distinctive type of landscape interaction that that uh, we should pay attention to. I, mean, I don't mean I sometimes I've been saying unique, and I shouldn't say unique because I don't mean only. I don't mean this. This is the only time it's happened. I, I should say distinctive. Um, but I also think that you know if we apply the logics of forensics, for instance, the study of crimes and investigations and, and solving mysteries, we actually can sort of flesh out some of how mystery solving shapes the landscape uses. So I'm gonna go through and talk about some of these things, you know, and, and I'm, I'm intentionally using criminal investigations as a sort of analogy here. Investigating research, uh, witnesses, getting to the scene, investigating the site, pondering suspects, and saving the evidence. These are all things that um, uh, helps shape the environmental practices of Tunguska research. Now, interviewing the witnesses. Now, this, of course, begins um, even before they get to the site, which is why I put it on here, um, where there's an effort um, to collect, uh, first to collect, well, first, the newspapers report about it. Um, that's uh, the voice of Tomsk from 1908, um, report that, hey, some, there was something observed, there's some shaking, we don't know what happened. Um, by the 1920s, you have ethnographers um, talking to Ivenki witnesses who were near Ivenki Ranger, uh, some of the most proximate people nearby were Ivenki Ranger herders. And you know these, these Soviet ethnographers were often, I mean, really helping bring Soviet institutions to these places, but in the, in the side, asking them about this thing that happened in 1908. Um, that's um, one, one of them, two, well, both of them actually end up, of these two, um, end up becoming guides then for the expeditions later on. Um, over time, these collection of testimonies get to over a thousand people that they talk to, that at least some grandmother in the 1960s remembers being told about it secondhand, right? Um, and hearing something about it. Um, and this sort of, you know, practice of thoroughly looking through as many people as it possibly can, can get um, is part of, of how they view this um, relationship to the land. They also look for, of course, non-human witnesses, whether it's the trees, as um, this uh, image of, of what Kulik encountered, but also what um, the scientists later inspected um, uh, indicates or paying attention to the um, noctilucent clouds. There were sort of abnormal uh, white nights after the event um, that they, they uh, investigate very deeply. Or things like looking for, witness, uh, for witnesses for, uh, of the uh, damage in the elements of the landscape itself, including genetic abnormalities in ants. Uh, this is a this is a, a drawing that they sort of the amateur researchers draw as a sort of humorous um, uh, uh, portrayal of it. But they go through the the research teams throughout the decades go through extensive sort of who might be a witness, how might that witness help us understand what happened? They interview every single person who might possibly know anything about it. Um, they also search the landscape, search records um, throughout the world to try to get a sense of this, okay? Another part of mystery solving is, is getting to the scene, you know, and often crimes that's not, you know, the hardest thing, but that was an extremely hard thing for the um, uh, initial expeditions. Um, this is from the 1929 ex exhibition where they uh, bring in 50 cartloads um, carried by uh, reindeer into the site after having to you know, take a train to Kansk, uh, ferry, uh, you know, take uh, sleds up part of the way and finally hike in. Um, and eventually they build an entire infrastructure, including huts and trails at this site that are purely designed for the purpose of getting there. Um, and the throw uh, Kulika, the, the path of Kulik, is one that then, in the later period, people are taking every single year uh, if they're not uh, uh, traversing up the rivers, which they often can't for because they're frozen or or 
unnavigable for, for various reasons. Um, then, of course, they investigate the site. And I'm going to go into the, some of the different elements of this, but I want to first show uh, some video footage of the 1928 expedition that gets at some of how they're treating the landscape in a way that's purely, that's, that's oriented towards solving mystery. You see some of the things they, they did there, including draining wetlands, because they suspected that a uh, meteorite lay in one of the um, bogs that existed at the site. Um, so um, during one of these expeditions, they uh, drill, uh, they, they, they cut through a huge portion of uh, one of the wetlands to drain the entire thing, hoping to find a meteorite there and instead find a tree stump which not only isn't a meteorite, but shows pretty conclusively that there could not have been a meteorite that landed there because it would have been obliterated. Um, they also survey with magnetures um, for, for uh, specks of iron throughout uh, a vast territory in the epicenter. Um, this later becomes involved in other types of searches for material. Um, they, uh, as well, drill into permafrost. Um, they put up these drilling huts that is, um, tries to go down as far as they can to find sort of evidence of disturbance in the landscape that might indicate that a huge blast had happened in the um, land itself. Um, they, of course, you know, look at suspect rocks and uh, they, they think it must be an iron meteorite in the 1920s uh, and, and, and search for that. So these are some of the ways that they start to investigate the site, okay, it is on the site looking, you know, oh, another thing is they start to map the trees. Um, you saw in the video some of the trees that were existing, they start a project of mapping where the trees are falling and what direction they're falling, okay. Um, these are all sort of behaviors that are, 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 are about figuring out what, what to do. And again, they, they justify, they, they don't want to get rid of those trees on the ground. So that's the preservation. We keep the trees that are on the ground uh, until we've plotted them out completely. But this wetland, this bog, obviously we should just destroy it in order to see if there's a meteorite there. So this sort of balance of intrusion and preservation is shaped by this imperative. Um, another sort of main way that they investigate the site is they um, arrange for aerial photography, which is a quite laborious and complex endeavor. Um, they, they start making these claims that we need to do this as soon as possible in the late 20s, and it doesn't happen until the late 30s that they're able to actually arrange for um, an airplane to make the tracks over it. And even when they do, the, uh, this is obviously a bad photo, but the, the evidence that they get is quite unclear and doesn't actually help um, shed as much light on, on the, um, on the, on the ground as they would like. Um, later on, they, um, of course, uh, continue, uh, once the uh, hypothesis that this is a nuclear explosion comes into existence, they begin investigating that. First, most immediately by measuring radioactivity. Um, and interestingly enough, they actually get positive results that there seems to be heightened radioactivity at the site, but then deeper research seems to indicate that it was most likely because of fallout 
night, you know, you measure anywhere for radioactivity in, in the early 1960s. There's a lot of nuclear fallout globally. Um, and then sort of natural radioactivity from the, um, that, that occurs geologically in, in the place as well. Um, but they continue then to think about other types of um, ways of searching for evidence of a nuclear blast, looking at the burns on trees, looking at the burns on trees, looking at the um, uh, genetic abnormalities in pine needles and ants, um, looking uh, for thermalescence, uh, ther thermoluminescence in the, um, uh, in the soil and peat samples, um, and also looking for uh, uh, what was it? geomagnetic anomalies. Um, in the meantime, the amateur researchers have fully managed to plot out the um, forest fault, and they discover that instead of being a, a circle or an oval, it appears to be shaped more like a butterfly. And in some ways, this actually deepens the mystery because they don't understand how the physics, how, how the physics of an explosion could possibly have um, created a pattern like this. Though later, sort of uh, testing with computer models uh, and experiments in other places uh, sort of shed light on how this would be possible with an above ground explosion. Um, the search for material, of course, also includes in terms of uh, continues throughout the decades. They're not just going there doing nothing. They are. They start um, uh, searching soils for cosmic dust. Once they essentially give up on finding a large meteorite, they uh, determine that they need to figure out whether there are other types of cosmic material. And essentially, they find it, but they are not able to conclusively say that that cosmic dust can be dated to 1908. And so that whole progress process of of many, many decades of taking, you know, excavating columns of peat um, and uh, su uh, subjecting it to both on site within the field uh, and uh, later uh, laboratory analysis becomes, uh, does not uh, come to full fruition in terms of shedding uh, conclusive light on what happened. Um, the other, another, the other, another um, part of mystery solving is pondering suspects. And of course, this occurs both uh, uh, in you know, the centers of scientific power in St. Petersburg, Vladimir Vernadsky, um, uh, uh, the well-known geochemist, uh, geo, uh, um, comes up with the idea that it might have been a comet or related to a comet instead of meteorite pretty early on in the 1930s. It also occurs in the field, um, there's all sorts of discussions that they essentially these amateur expeditionaries are talking about what this could be every night at the campfire, at the end of an at the end of the day, with their own sort of ideas. There, these ideas end up being more than a hundred hypotheses, is what sometimes is said. Beyond the sort of main ideas that it's either a meteorite, which most people give up on being a meteorite because a meteorite technically has to be something that hits the ground. And they almost all agree that the explosion must have been above ground. Um, it could have been an airburst of an asteroid. That's sort of the most common view now. A comet, a nuclear explosion caused by aliens. Um, there's also ideas that it was antimatter, a miniature black hole, uh, a plasmoid, all lightning, Nikola Tesla's experiment. Um, essentially, the list goes on and on. And be, there becomes this dynamic um, by the 70s and 80s where essentially people are writing into these popular science journals proposing their own ideas of Tunguska left, right, and center. Um, uh, most of these aren't treated all that seriously by the researchers, even the other amateur researchers, but there becomes a whole dynamic that now one of the things that we need to do with Tunguska is come up with a new solution. And it inspires this whole sort of um, you know, idea of let's let's come up with new distinctive solutions for it. Um, a final sort of uh, dynamic that goes on um, with uh, that that help that, through which the idea of mystery solving helps us understand the environmental uh, dimensions of Tunguska is the idea of preser preserving the evidence, saving the evidence, and this starts very early on. This starts from the nineteen 
1920s and 1930s where there's immediately this like, hey, the forest is regrowing. We need to get out there and do this now. This um, comes to the fore, especially in the idea that they need to, the justifications for trying to do an aerial survey. We need to get there before the, the forest has regrown so that we can actually adequately assess the site, right? By the early 1960s, this has be becomes, we need to form a uh, zakaznik. This is one of the forms of uh, protect nature protection territories uh, that, that uh, existed in the Soviet Union um, in order to save the evidence. So, you know, the scientists have no problems cutting down trees themselves. They have no problems even cutting down trees to just burn in the, the campfire, right? Um, but they, the idea that they would, you'd get rid of the evidence of the blast seems to be a, a complete, completely unacceptable and completely you know, immoral almost. Um, so you have this very interesting path towards conservation that these researchers undergo. And most of them would say, oh, I'm not an environmentally interested, but they kind of come to be environmentally inclined in this place um, because of um, the, the, they, they feel that they need to um, protect the evidence for future generations so that, you know, as they, they even say, a hundred years from now, maybe they'll have the techniques to figure out what happened here. And we, it is our job to the future generations to, to do this. Um, and it eventually succeeds. Um, they eventually uh, get a, a Zapovednik uh, nature, uh, the sort of highest level of nature protection um, uh, in the 1990s. Um, and that's where, what the territory is today, the, the Hungluski Zapovednik. Um, and it, you know, there's a sort of irony about this, though, is that a lot of the amateur researchers today would say that actually they wish they had made it a natural park instead. They would because the heightened protection of the Zapovenik actually has prevented mm -hmm. them from continuing to go there and do research as easily. Now, a lot of this has to do with the changing political economy of the post-Soviet era um, and and uh, some of the limited uh, uh, ways that, that things became a lot more expensive for a lot of people. A lot of this stuff was sort of subsidized by the state, even if it was just people paying it off of their free time. They had free time, they had um, resources to do this. Um, and so now there's sort of bittersweet feelings about the fact that this place is closed. Um, though it did lead to this uh, uh, protection. Now, to conclude, I would just say that I think that, so this main idea I've been hitting on about mystery solving today, um, I think uh, it helps teach us something about the influence of place in environmental history. Like something different. It's not a sort of Bill Cronin, um, you know, thinking about how wilderness is also in your own backyard type of thing. It's a different sort of connection between a place, a, a distinctive connection between a place and environmental knowledge and environmental experiences in it. Um, and it, it is one that, um, as in some of my previous research, really does put the material aspects of that environment of the environment at the forefront in us thinking about how uh, it's not just humans thinking about nature, but it's also nature helping humans and shaping how humans think about it. Thank you. <laughs>